Hey everyone, and today we are going to be reviewing a book I have been reading and making notes on for quite a while. And uh, look at this. Look at all my little my little sea life animals here. I've got some penguins, I've got some seals. Okay, I've got two animals, but they're all marking pages in this book that I want to talk about. I'm sorry, I just hit the mic. Uh, this book is Hot Feminist by Polly Vernon. So this was first published back in 2015, so we're going back four years now, which is weird. 2015 seems like a second ago. Hey, Kyra. Making your bed again. Good girl. Love you, little dog. Uh, yeah, this girl's quite a stir, and since reading it, since finishing it, um, I checked out the reviews on Goodreads, and they really are a mixed bunch. There are a lot of people who are surprisingly angry at Polly for her kind of version of feminism that she portrays in this book, but also just her personality in general. They really seem to dislike her for some reason, which is so weird because I found her such a, like, normal but likeable and just really relatable woman. A lot of people seem to think she's quite full of herself just because she has confidence in certain areas and she's not afraid to say like I like this about myself or I like this about myself and these are my insecurities. A lot of people seem to take problem with that and I find that really odd. A Hot Feminist as a book is Polly Vernon's take on modern day feminism. She doesn't really like the whole outrage culture, she doesn't like cancel culture. Um, and she kind of wrote about it before it even became as big as it is now. She doesn't like what she calls the fear of getting it wrong online. She doesn't like this culture of like man-hating and anti-men and whatever. She also doesn't like this idea of almost like policing or gatekeeping feminism, saying you can't be a feminist if, you know, for example, you like makeup, which I obviously do. Have you seen my face today? People who say you can't be a feminist if you wear these types of shoes or these types of clothes or you read these types of books or you like this type of music or you have a crush on such and such a person. She hates that and she's like, no, screw it. My take on feminism is all about being who you want to be and I find it very empowering and I like that. It's very, very, very real, very practical. There were some parts of the book that I didn't agree with and some parts that I didn't like. For example, there's a part where she interviews Lena Dunham and kind of like talks about her and kind of bigs her up as this like big feminist icon. And some of you may know, some of you may not. I really dislike Lena Dunham. I think as a person, she's incredibly problematic. She has some horrific views. She's said and done some horrific things. And I just greatly dislike her. So I didn't enjoy that part of the book. But the rest of it, I thought we could kind of go through at least a couple of these parts that I've highlighted, as you can see, there's a lot. But I thought we could go few, through a few bits today, read a few passages, and bring up a few discussion points that could be interesting. Some of it you might agree with me on, some of it you might disagree with me on, some of it you li might like what Polly says, some of it you might hate what Polly says. But either way, I think this is going to make for a very interesting video, and I think it brings up a lot of topics that we need to talk about as a community in general. It looks a lot at how we treat people online and how we respond to when people do something right or wrong. And I think, again, these are things that, particularly at this point in time, we need to talk about and discuss more and be more open to people making mistakes and being human and knowing how to deal with that instead of just saying, cancel them, they're terrible, you screwed up, you bad person. So the first bit I actually want to talk about is uh, the little foreword that she wrote for this paperback edition. Um, which was new for this edition. This is what she wrote in response to a lot of the backlash she got for the first hardback edition of the book that she published back in 2015. She writes that, while I knew it was likely that Hot Feminist would cause some controversy, you don't call a book Hot Feminist, without at least hoping it will cause some controversy, will make people sit up and take notice, I didn't expect a full throttle scary raging river of fury and bile to be unleashed upon me. I mean, it's a book, and quite a mild-mannered one at that. It's not a crime or a sex scandal. So there were times of the weeks and months following publication when it felt as if it was a crime or a sex scandal. A full throttle scary raging river of fury and bile was what I got. A little later she writes, I'd love to tell you I reveled in the furore. I'd love to tell you I lapped it up as a sign that I'd hit a big fat nerve, started a conversation that needed to be had, that I embraced it as proof of the relevance of everything I say within this very book about how dangerously judgmental, narrow and stagnant feminism in particular and debate in general can be, and how increasingly hard it is to risk an opinion or a perspective that hasn't already been ratified by nine-tenths of Twitter, how we all live with fear of getting it wrong. I know some writers, broadcasters, celebs, politicians and whatever do enjoy that level of aggro. They take it as proof of their currency. They stoke the fires of crossness. They shout back. Not me. I responded with quietness and sadness. I ducked off Twitter. I went to ground. 
Weirdest of all, I felt something I never really felt before, or certainly not to the extent I felt it then. I felt shame. This kind of hit me so hard because I've been there so many times in the short two years I've been on YouTube. You say something that you think is quite a standard opinion or something quite mild, or you mix something up a little bit, you say the wrong word at the wrong time, or you get a fact wrong, or you have an opinion that's slightly out there, or um, maybe you just mispronounce a word, maybe you say one person's name instead of another person's name. Anything can happen, anything that you might not even notice or pick up on, and suddenly everyone hates you for it, and you do feel so much shame and guilt, and there are so many times I too have had to just like turn off my phone and shut down social media for a while, or not make a YouTube video or whatever, and it it messes me up so badly and I don't think people often realize the real world effects that their words can have on people. I had um, an email from someone the other week uh, that didn't like how I handled the Slazo situation. So I know a few of you might have seen this go down but like Slazo was accused of sexually and verbally and emotionally abusing his ex-girlfriend by his ex-girlfriend and I waited like two weeks until after this happened and the only response he'd given was essentially him admitting to doing some of this stuff and so I was like well there seems to be a hell of a lot of proof at this point I'm gonna make a video talking about this but we're not gonna like target Slazo specifically instead we're gonna talk about these ideas and try and be like okay well if this happens to you or if this happened to someone is it right or wrong? Why is this bad? What can we learn from it? And that's what I tried to do with my video. And then literally like two days later, Slazo came out with this video saying like, look, none of it happened. I'm a good guy. Um, and then everyone got mad at me for being like, oh my God, why couldn't you have waited? You're a terrible person. You should have known. So I was like, oh crap. Okay. Well, maybe I messed up in using him as an example, but I still stand by a lot of the things I said about I think these conversations need to happen, and I think this needs to happen, and so on and so on. Um, but people weren't okay with that. Um, so I spoke about it a little bit on Discord, I spoke about it a little bit on Twitter, I left a pinned comment on the video, and then after a few days I unlisted the video because I didn't think it was useful anymore, and if the things weren't true I didn't want them up there, um, no matter how much I figured people could learn from them. So that's what I did. And I still got these like essay length emails from people just calling me names and calling me a terrible person and calling me a disgusting slut whore bitch um, and I was like I didn't think I messed up this much I thought in making the video I was doing the right thing I thought in unlisting the video but still talking about it I was doing the right thing but no matter what I did people weren't happy and so I spent probably about two weeks not making videos after that and like I published some videos I'd already made and stuff like that and I published content on Instagram and stuff that I'd already done um, there were photos of me like in outfits and makeup going out places none of it from those two weeks all of it was old stuff that I'd done in the past and like saved the photos to post at a later date in case in case I needed to like take time off like this because um, I felt so crappy from all the stuff people were saying to me and like when I say all the people I mean I got like five people doing this and it still made me feel this bad that I just like shut myself off and I couldn't leave my house and um yeah I I cried and it was messy and I couldn't bring myself to make anything new when I didn't feel good enough and I yeah I genuinely considered like shutting down my YouTube channel and then I was like well what am I going to do for a job and then I was like an absolute wreck. Point is, yeah, once I like screwed up a little bit and then this whole like response was blown out of proportion. But with hindsight looking back, logically I can say I still stand by what I did there and like how I responded to things and everything. And I do think the response was blown out of proportion. But in the weeks following, I definitely had this fear of getting it wrong with anything I posted anywhere. So yeah, relatable. Anyway, we haven't even gotten to the book yet and I've already like given you personal stories here. Polly defines a hot feminist as one who cares greatly about the way she looks and greatly about the rights of women, feels that neither concern is compromised by the other. I love that. 
would indeed go as far as to say each reinforces the other. Her legs are probably shaved, her lips are probably by Mac. Now mate, Nyx. Um, her wardrobe is on point, her wit is never diminished, she views her own intrinsic sexiness not as an impediment of her feminist politics, but rather as its rocket fuel. I kind of love that. She talks about how there are certain things she likes. She likes makeup, she likes clothes, she likes fashion, she likes beauty products. Um, she has actual opinions on things like Botox and fake tan and Spanx and serums and facelifts. And while she doesn't like all of them, she still thinks about them and cares about them. And she says, what does this mean? Nothing, everything. Does it make me vain, shallow, vacuous, silly? Oh, maybe a bit. But aren't we all just a little, just a touch, vain, shallow, vacuous, etc.? Does it make me human? Entirely. Does it make me a feminist? Well, I'll tell you what. At the very, very least, it doesn't get in the way. And I love this because a big critique I get, um, often, strangely, from people like Kent Hovind's fans, they're quite big on this. They always tell me that because I dye my hair, because I wear makeup, because I wear certain clothes, whatever, because as well as science and social stuff and politics and philosophy and theology, as well as all that, I also enjoy music and books and girly TV and makeup and clothes and shopping. Because I enjoy all of that as well, I'm somehow silly and vapid and none of my opinions can be taken seriously. And I just think it's such a stupid, naive, outdated view. Women can enjoy more than one thing and enjoying makeup doesn't mean I can't know my stuff about science as well. Enjoying clothes doesn't mean I'm not very well educated. Just because I like to take pride in my appearance and feel good about how I look, that doesn't mean I'm not extremely qualified in a number of areas. Um, I'm, <laughs> I was gonna say, I'm a, I'm a very good businesswoman. Um, but no, my degree is in business and I worked in digital marketing and I did very well. I was head of marketing for a company at the age of 21. You don't get there by being a vapid, silly girl. You can get there by working very hard and knowing your stuff. Polly faces very similar criticism to me. So she's actually a journalist um, and I know her mostly from her columns in uh, Grazia magazine. Uh, but she's also written for newspapers and done tons of other stuff as well, as well as writing this book. She faces a lot of the same criticisms from people as I do. Uh, she writes about like some of the things she's interested in and some of, the, some of the things she likes. And she says, I've had enough people ask me in real life and online how the hell it makes me any kind of feminist at all. Me with my hair and my lipstick and my etc and so on. How dare a woman like me call herself a feminist? I have thought about it because it seems to come up a lot because it bothers me. I have wondered whether everything I think and feel about my face and my body and my wardrobe can coexist with everything I hope and want for my gender. Yeah, but am I a feminist really, I've asked me? And my answer has always been, yeah, you are. You are. Because caring about your looks has never stopped you caring about the bigger feminist picture. Because it didn't obscure or inhibit your enduring desire that women should get a better deal than we already are, to feel more valued, more powerful, stronger and safer because it doesn't get in the way of recognizing how, how hard it still is to be female, how diminished many of us feel much of the time, how out and out threatened, endangered, and in fear um, of our bloody lives others of us are. Because it's never shoved you in the mean girl camp of excluding and diminishing those women who don't care as much about the way they look or who choose to look differently to you, because you just are. What kind of feminist does that make me? The shavy, leggy, fa fashion fixated, wrinkle averse, weight conscious kind of feminist. The kind who likes hot pink and boys. I'm the sort of feminist who has forcibly nabbed some ownership over the way she looks, who shapes and moulds it for power over situations in which she finds herself. And she kind of like goes on like this, and I just, I think it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I love that she's not ashamed of who she is and what interests her, and how instead of using her love of like fashion and makeup as saying, well, like, I'm a feminist despite of this, she says, no, I'm a feminist with this. And I love that. She never lets the, the, the silly stuff, the, the vapid stuff, her more flighty interests, she never lets it diminish everything else about her. She uses them to build herself up, and I kind of love that. It's like, it's very easy to say women should feel empowered and confident and so on, but part of feeling empowered and confident is in loving how you look. And sometimes we don't always love how we naturally look. Sometimes I need to do bold eyebrows or put on red lipstick or wear my favourite pair of boots to feel empowered and confident. And there's nothing wrong with that, because the end result is still that I feel empowered and confident. And that's what the goal should be. It shouldn't really matter how we get there, whether we do it by loving who we are naturally, or by moulding and shaping that a little bit. 
there's a fantastic chapter called Feminist Fatigue, Fit Shame and Fear of Getting It Wrong where she talks about how her and her friends feel kind of exhausted by the type of feminism that is definitely pushed online today, especially by SJWs, especially by the people who um, are kind of very into outrage culture. They talk about how they're bored of people telling them what they can and can't wear, what they should and shouldn't shave, um, where they should and shouldn't be shopping, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, she talks about one of her friends and says that she has feminist fatigue too. She's 38 and a mate of a mate. She asked me why I called myself a feminist once over casual Christmas cocktails, and I asked her why she didn't. Because it used to be men who tried to tell me what to do, she replied. Now it's other women calling themselves feminists. I do think that's the case. There's a lot of people who get really into telling people what they can and can't be, and but you can't be a feminist if you do this. You can't be a feminist if you do this. And it's not just feminism. It's all kinds of things. Recently online, there's been a lot of talk about like who is and isn't an ally to the LBGT plus community. It's like, you can't be an ally if you don't agree with 100% of what this trans person says. And that's such a horrible, terrible way of looking at things. You might have seen recently, I got an absolutely like horrible set of emails from a person who said, as a trans person, they didn't feel safe in my online spaces, and I didn't know what this meant. We kind of had this discussion, there was a lot of back and forth and all this stuff, and um, ultimately they turned around and said like, well look, you can say you're an ally to trans people, and like, I didn't, other people have told me I'm an ally, I've just been out there pushing for equality and, you know, defending their rights, whatever. And he's like, but the truth is you don't, you care about all people. I'm like, of course I care about all people, but also, I do stand up for trans people's rights everywhere I can. When I see people being transphobic, I call it out. When I see um, negative behaviour towards trans people, I call it out where I can. Yeah, I, I'd had this whole thing in an email and it was really bizarre because it was like, because I didn't 100% agree with essence of thought, this person said I couldn't be an ally. And I find that really bizarre. And it's the same way that these people are like, well, if you don't do this and don't do this, you're not a real feminist. And I hate this gatekeeping. I hate this idea of you're not a real blank if. I don't know. What I love about this book is that it shows there are so many ways to be a feminist and so many ways to be a strong, empowered woman. And it's not all one size fits all. I, I kind of love that. Polly actually blames like the internet a lot for our kind of judginess of each other, and I thoroughly agree. She says about feminism, uh, Feminism has been engulfed in a heady swirl of anxiety and doubt and self-doubt and women talking shit about other women because their ideas of what is and isn't feminist don't match. And in the case of two of her friends at least, Ennui, though my suspicion is the feminist fatigue is the end consequence of fear of getting it wrong, the point you get to when you just can't bear risking it anymore. Feminism has been derailed by doubt. Feminism has been hijacked by the dark forces of judginess, by our communally created fear that our every deed, word, thought, joke, and tweet is monitored for screw-ups. Feminism is increasingly defined by a sense of what you can't do and shouldn't say. She talks about blaming the internet for a range of things, and I blame the internet for the cult of what it calls sharing and I call showing off. I certainly blame it for making mutual, non-stop, 24-7 rolling judginess a reality. The internet, whose prime purpose appears to be giving us a window into each other's lives, hopes, fears, and thoughts, so we might then slag each other off because of them. The internet which encourages us to have an opinion about absolutely everything all the time, only it turns out that the easiest opinion to maintain is that everything everyone else has said before is absolute poop. I don't want to swear that much, I've already said one. Judging, criticising, trolling, and diminishing. So much easier than risking our own ideas. So much handier than having to formulate an opinion or create an or create a perspective, or stand for something, anything, other than everyone else is stupid. We judge each other so harshly and so repeatedly, and on the grounds of our hopes, dreams, desires, views, interior design concepts, hairstyles, an approach to motherhood, choice of partner, choice of smartphones, taste in literature, and so on and so on. We hate read and we troll, we sneer, we, and we disapprove every time the opportunity presents itself, and so inevitably feminism has become caught in this same toxic swirl. And then, on a high note, she says, What I would like to propose is an end to all that judgement, right here, right now. Let's call today Non-Judgement Day. The dawning of a brave new era of accepting that not everyone feels the same way you do about stuff. But that's fine. Of objecting to the things others say, assuming you find them objectionable, without feeling duty-bound to destroy the person they are at the same time. I love this woman so much. Skipping forward a little bit, she has a few chapters about clothes and fashion and how what we wear helps define us and who we are as people. And I think 
it's wonderfully empowering. She shares a lot of her own stories about growing up and how she kind of like finally discovered her own style and stuff like that, which if you're not really into fashion might not interest you, but I also think it's interspersed with some really wonderful, empowering uh, little bits of advice, I guess you could say. She talks a little bit about why women in particular, but also just people, why we dress. And a lot of the comments that I often get on my channel and even on Instagram and all sorts of places is whenever I wear something that's a little bit fun or, um, I don't know, just a little bit different, a lot of people are like, who are you trying to impress? Are you dressing for men? You're just trying to do this. And I'm like, no, screw that. Most of the time I'm dressing for me because I want to feel good about myself. I want to feel confident. I want to feel in control. I want to own my body and I want to have fun with what I wear and express myself through that. Um, sometimes we do dress for other people and that is more than okay. And Polly writes about that quite a bit to talk about her own experience experiences. She says, I'm a woman and here's why I dress the way I dress. Sometimes I do it not to impress men, but to terrify them, to confuse and challenge and alarm and destabilize them. And sometimes I do do it to impress men. It's just that the specific man I'm seeking to impress is gay with an aesthetic so evolved I gasp every time he enters the room. Sometimes I dress because I've awoken and been overwhelmed by the certainty that today's the day I'll bump into an ex and though I am without question entirely over it, I still need him to experience a bittersweet pang of regret over the woman he's destined to spend eternity without. And sometimes I dress because I've awoken and been overwhelmed by the certainty that today is the day my path will collide with that of a professional nemesis and I need her to fall to her knees and quake in the face of my superior fashion vibe. Sometimes I dress because I want to fit in or stand out, or dominate or intimidate or amuse or surprise or subvert, because I want to rule over a meeting or perk up a funeral con congregation, or own a reunion, or spark some tension, I don't know, Sometimes I dress to compete with other women, but rarely, if ever, will I be competing with them for the attention of men. Sometimes I dress in a way I know men won't get, won't appreciate, won't understand, won't enjoy. But women will, and that's the point. And sometimes I do dress to seduce, to all out, no excuses, no two ways about it, pull. And then to end this chapter she says, But wait, there's one other reason hot feminists get dressed, and it's the most important one. One which stays the same regardless of all other circumstances and intentions. The one which scotches all of the rationale. The one which means we'll take the pains over the getting dressed process for the rest of our lives. And it's this. Because we like doing it. Because we're good at it. Because there's an art to it and an end to it in itself. Because it's inherently creative. Because we all learn a little bit more every time we do it. Because we all make mistakes and correct the mistakes and get better at it still. And that's as rewarding as the acquiring of and improving on any knowledge or talent or craft no different to learning how to play the piano or cook a great meal or paint pictures or speak French. Getting dressed is a life skill. I love this. She sums it up. This is everything I say about makeup every time I get criticized for wearing too much makeup or being too bold or too bright or too in your face with my makeup. Or people who tell me that I don't need makeup. I look fine without it. I'm like, I know I look fine without makeup. I don't wear makeup to make me look better. I wear makeup for the fun of it because it's an expression because it's an art form within itself, because it's painting, it's creativity, it's art, but on my face. There's something so exciting and thrilling and fun about playing with new makeup products, with trying out different colors and techniques and trying out different things and learning things, and then trying to photograph it in the right lights and make it look as good on camera as you think it does in real life. And I just, I enjoy the whole process. As she says about fashion, with makeup for me, there's an art to it and an end to it in itself. It's inherently creative. And I love that. And the people who look down on makeup or clothes and think them vapid and useless or tell us we'd look better if, or you don't need this, you're missing the point entirely. It's not about that. It's never been about that. And it never will be about that. The last thing I want to mention about clothes is just to read this little paragraph that says, um, fashion, it's complicated. How's a hot feminist to proceed? By winning fashion by owning it rather than allowing it to own you, by understanding its power while denying its power over you, by using it as a medium for self-expression, for asserting the self, for claiming your spot on the planet, for declaring yourself well worth looking at, actually, and never using it as a disguise or an apology. A hot feminist understands that basically fashion is her bitch. I love Polly. How can anyone hate Polly Vernon? Seriously, she's amazing. She has a few uh, chapters about kind of like you know, dating and stuff. She has some about hair and body hair and head hair and all that kind of thing. She has chapters about weight 
and her approach to that. She has chapters about diet, exercise, aging. Actually, the aging thing is quite an interesting one because this is one I get quite a lot from the incels and MGTOW guys. They always tell me that when I reach a certain age, um, it always changes. I'm going to hit the wall and I'll be undesirable and then my life will be over because apparently all my life about is attracting men. Obviously, I have nothing else going on, do I? Um, apparently, as soon as I hit this wall, some people say it's 28, some people say 30, some people say 35, uh, some people say 25, so I've already hit it, been and gone, and it's all downhill from here. Um, but either way, these men tell me that once I hit the wall, once I stop being attractive to men, because apparently all men in the world have the same standards, then I'm worthless and there's nothing to me and my life will be miserable. And I find it so ridiculous that one, age is not the only thing about whether you're attractive to someone or not. Um, that's weird. Just because a lot of these men like prepubescent girls doesn't mean every normal man does. <sighs> There's that. But the other thing is, like, to link your worth to what a man thinks of you and whether he's attracted to you or not is so bizarre to me. Like, there's so much more to my life than whether men find me attractive or not. Honestly, like, if I stayed single for the rest of my life, absolutely fine. It doesn't matter, because I have so much more amazing stuff going on. I have wonderful friends, I have my dog, I have a house, I live by myself. I'm financially stable and independent, and I have a career that I love, a job that I love. I get to create things every single day. I have these amazing hobbies and things I do and things I'm working on, skills that I'm learning. There are books to read. Whether a man finds me attractive or not isn't essential or necessary or central to my life. Yeah, it's nice to go out somewhere and have a little bit of a flirt with someone or meet someone new. It's nice to go on dates. It's nice to like, you know, be in that stage where you're like, oh, do they like me? Do they not? Yeah, that stuff's nice, but it's not a central part of my life by any means. There's so much more to me than whether men think I'm attractive or not. And they seem to think that women can't do anything without a man. And that our only reason for being with a man is because we want their resources, their money, their this, their this. I'm like, no, screw that. I make my own money. I look after myself. I'm incredibly independent and I don't need a man. If I let another man into my life, like, to properly date me or whatever, it's going to be because I like them as a person and I like their company and I think we build each other up and make each other better. Not because I want something from them and not because I need someone to tell me they find me attractive. Simple as that. Another thing that I really enjoy about this book is that she doesn't uh, completely ignore men's issues. Some feminists you'll find are incredibly like man-hating and they don't care about men's issues. Polly doesn't do that. She's very aware of a lot of the issues I also care about in relation to men and I do think they are feminist issues because to me feminism is about equality of the genders. It's not just about women. It's about everyone. She acknowledges that men are suffering now too. I have no doubt about that. Their mental health issues are deeply troubling. Their suicide rate is, is horrific. Although she says she thinks that part of helping men and helping people in general is also pushing women to get ahead a little bit more. I'm not sure if I fully agree with her on this, but I think it's an interest interesting perspective and I would like to get your views on this. She says, I believe a more female skewed society would be a society that talks more and suppresses less, that destigmatizes expressing vulnerability and asking for help, that devalues stiff upper lip and celebrates heightened emotional intelligence. If more women are allowed to rise higher and higher in professional situations, more men are allowed to stay at home to raise their kids. If ancient and irrelevant expectations about the husbands and fathers being the prime breadwinners are eliminated, if the stresses and strains of our lives are redistributed evenly among the sexes, surely that's going to help everyone. Whenever a serious social inequality is righted, it just is better for absolutely everybody. So again, I find this interesting and I'm... <sighs> I'm not sure if that is the best and only solution. I can see where she's coming from, but I don't know. Interesting. Oh, and then she has a bit where she, like, talks to Lena Dunham and references her book, Not That Kind of Girl, which I swear is one of the worst, most disgusting, horrible, boring, dull, self-absorbed books I've ever read. Oh my god, if you think I talk about myself a lot, oh, that book. 
Oh, this is what I found quite interesting as well. She talks about um, like men and families, and she says we should ditch the good family man narrative. Nothing winds me up like this. Our capacity to congratulate men for having the astonishing decency not to ditch his missus and the kids for some spangly piece half his age, for turning up for bath time periodically, for being fun at the four-year-old's birthday bash. Nothing else demonstrates how much higher the domestic bar sits for women than it does men. You never hear a woman congratulated for being a good family woman because, well, we expect nothing less from a woman than she sticks by her man and her kids. So either we stop bandying about the expression good family man, stop telling men they're pretty much heroes for fulfilling their side of the domestic bargain, or we start calling women good family women too. It is quite interesting. I know it's not true in all families. Like, in my family, my dad was the one who, um, after he was made redundant from his job, he stayed home and, like, looked after me when I was a kid, or my mum went out to work, so I'm kind of used to that. With my brother and his wife, uh, she's a doctor, and he works for the student room, so she earns more money than him. So when they had their first kid and now with their second kid, Warren, my brother, is the one who's gone part-time so he can stay home and look after the kids more because it makes more financial sense. So I think there is definitely a shift towards that, but I also think there's more we can do to make sure that mothering isn't just a woman's role anymore. I also enjoy this book because Polly Vernon also doesn't want kids like me. This has been like a recurring theme on my channel in like the last month, but um, here we go. I don't bang on about it too much, it just keeps coming up for some reason. Chapter 19 is titled How Not to Have a Baby, and she opens it with I do not want children. I've never wanted children. Not having children was right up there with grow up hot in terms of my early defining ambitions. And unlike the hot, which remains an evolving work, I can say with absolute confidence that I have definitely pulled off my ultimate end goal of not having children. So far. <laughs> and then this is a bit that I found really interesting. She says, my childlessness is an accomplishment of kinds. It's not been easy. I don't mean physically. It's the easiest time not to have children physically is this. Hurrah for freely available contraception and reproductive rights in general, and for women not having our entire destinies tethered to our biological function, because risking pregnancy each and every time you have sex can seriously mess up a lady's capacity to run the world slash have good sex. But emotionally and culturally, not having kids is difficult. A challenge even. At this point I should mention that Polly also lives in London like me, so here in the UK, we are lucky when it comes to our reproductive rights that we have access to early stage abortions if we need them, we have access to free contraception, we are very lucky. This same thing could not be written if she was based in many states in America or many other countries around the world. So what's super relatable is that she says, I was very young the first time I thought, yeah, about that. Not sure I'm mother material. I was still a child, seven at the oldest. Yep, can relate to that. <laughs> but yeah, she talks about how no one really accepts this idea of a woman not wanting kids. Everyone always tells us we're going to change our mind if this and this and this and this. She talks about how that when she talks about the fact she doesn't want kids, she says, On expressing these perspectives, which I did regularly, I was informed with certainty and by almost everyone that I was quite wrong and would change my mind. I've been there too. I changed my mind when I was older, when I fell in love, when my friends started having babies. I changed my mind because I, like all girls, was fitted with a biological clock with a ticking hormonal time bomb of a prompt on procreation, which would erupt at some point, sure as eggs is ovaries, or eggs, overriding my intellect, reducing me to the baby craving equivalent of a zombie, urging me to get myself the hell knocked up. I changed my mind because to remain childless was selfish. I changed my mind because I just would. She's like, ha guess again. She says, baby's just not my thing. And then she talks a little bit about this and says, it's more that I'm alarmed by the prospect of being eaten whole with my preoccupation for something that will never love me as much as I love it. Because that's kind of the deal with kids. And come on, you've got to really want something if you're prepared to sacrifice, in no particular order. Your career, finances, body, relationship, and life to it. I agree. Like, a lot of people have told me that, not joking, I should just have kids because why not? And you'll probably regret it if you don't. It's not a why not. There's so much thought and so much that goes into having kids. I don't want to risk my career, finances, body, relationship, and life just because well, you might change your mind once you're pregnant or you might change your mind once the kid comes or you'll love it when it's here. That's not a risk I'm ever willing to take. And she points out that all these things men never have to consider when becoming parents. All those things which have made me think often, I'd love to be a dad. I think I'd make an excellent dad, I really do. I genuinely envy men their abilities to be a dad. And that's actually the weird thing, because I think if I was a man, maybe I would want kids. It's a lot easier for a man. You don't have to deal with carrying the pregnancy, giving birth. You don't have to deal with so much of the emotional um, and physical burden of it. Just, yeah. 
I don't know. And then she talks about the gap between women with kids and women without. The chasm between women with kids and women without has never been deeper and wider and less bridgeable than it is right now. It's never been as dark and divisive. It's never been as problematic. She says that there's definitely um, a, a sort of narrative being pushed by the media and also online culture that's ended up with women believing they can't merely be mothers. They have to be unimaginably, unimaginably perfect mothers. These pressures and shifting goalposts and growing demands and expectations transform women with kids into second-guessing, super-precious, eternally anxious, overburdened and oversubscribed individuals, frazzled and weary and so very judged, and they make those of us without kids, either by choice or by circumstance, feel ignored and irrelevant and like we're being excluded from the only game in town worth playing sidelined, lessened, constantly required to step aside and allow the women with kids to monopolise the limelight, the priority seating, the broader cultural debate, the drama. We are reimagined as barren failures or cold, hard, career-fixated mega-bitches living a joyless, loveless half-life. So many people see me like that, and I'm not. There's a chapter about rape and consent, and yeah, that's quite an emotional one. There's also a chapter about kind of like basically reclaiming our sexuality and how a lot of women are definitely pushed towards being more passive and seen as being more passive. Like we are the pursued, never the pursuers. And that's just so outdated and untrue. She talks about how women do have things that we find attractive in men and how we do have standards and there are things that we like and we do occasionally objectify men as much as they objectify us. It's just a part of being human and that there's nothing wrong with that. She says feminists flirt by never doing a baby voice. We flirt with politics, religion, war in our general flirtatious discourse. We do not subdue our opinions for anyone. We find that if we smile while maintaining our principles and perspectives ferociously, only utter twats will be turned off. <laughs> I love it. We never hide how funny we are. We listen, we ask questions, we prompt. We don't deny our feminist politics should they arise in course of casual flirty chat. Rather, we integrate them into the seductive process. If we lie about the quanti quantity of our ex-lovers, we lie up. This is another thing. I have so many people in the comments, like, making assumptions about the number of people I dated or otherwise in the past. It's no one's business and it doesn't matter. Like, I don't think it makes me any more or less of a woman whether my number is low or high. It doesn't matter. You don't ask this about men, do you? Male YouTubers, when was the last time someone commented on Pewdie PewDiePie's video saying, yeah, but how many people have you slept with? Can we really trust your opinion if you've slept with more than X number of people? No, no one cares. It's a double standard and it's ridiculous. What I quite like is she has this whole um, chapter at the end about the kind of joys of saying no and turning things down and it's something that I'm very bad at and I just struggle with everything. Then there's like a little chapter at the end called like everything else you ever wanted to know and she has a small paragraph on niqabs and burqas and yeah I thoroughly agree with her here and that is that I don't know what to think and sorry Kyra's snoring in the background you can probably hear her she's being a real cutie um but she says oh I struggle with this my instinct tells me no woman should hide herself from the world because her religion dictates it. Yeah. And on the grounds that her husband will enjoy her more if he can revel in the knowledge that she is generally unlooked upon. His special treat to lust over in private. Yeah, I agree with that. Completely on board. And how can I possibly defend a woman's right to wear anything she likes? To wear as little as she likes, or as many hats as she likes, or as much skin-type body con as she likes, regardless of her age, while simultaneously decrying this specific clothing choice. I just can't. And I'm like, yes, exactly, this this is the issue I have. Like, on the one hand, things like burqas seem so repressive, and I don't think any woman should be forced to wear it ever. However, I think if it is a woman's choice, then who am I to tell her what she should or shouldn't be wearing? But then again, for a lot of women, it's not a choice, and they feel guilty guilted and shamed into it, in which case I want to stand up and say, no, you don't need to do that, but at the same time, if it makes them more comfortable, if it makes them feel stronger and empowered, then why shouldn't they? It's complicated, there's so much to it, and like Polly, I don't have a definitive conclusion or opinion at this moment. Oh, I love this bit as well, she talks about the victimification of women, and this is another thing that I feel very strongly about, um, and that I've seen a lot online uh, recently, is that people wanting to play the victims, people enjoy this victim role. And while it's true that sometimes people are victims of things, I don't think we should strive to be victims. We should strive to be more than that constantly. 
She says stuff is not brilliant for women. There's a shitload of work to be done, but it needs to be approached from a position of strength and possibility, not from a place of, oh, poor us. We are victims of some stuff, of some situations, and certainly of general injustice, but we must not define ourselves as victims. See, this is why I love Polly so much. We are winning some battles, reformatting some wars. We are also badly behaved, contradictory, naughty, funny, silly, messy, and more than capable of making a victim of someone else. All of which is preferable to and more powerful than occupying a perennial victim role. Part of the struggle for increased equality is the struggle to be allowed to just be bad sometimes. Oh, and then she has this last little bit on the, the unflagging and unquestioning allegiance to the sisterhood. She says the notion of sisterhood is gorgeous in theory, but unworkable in practice. I wouldn't believe you for a heartbeat if you said you loved all women. Far too many of us are vile or not playing by the same rules, and that's without taking into account the very real issue of how violently our personalities can clash, on account of there being so very many of us. Madeleine Albright once said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women, and while I commend her intentions, I also think she hasn't met some of the women I've met. The kind will view another woman's willingness to help them as readily as a readily exploited sign of weakness because of course being a woman doesn't predispose you to being a good person in addition to which no one ever expected a man to go off his way to help another man no bloke ever stopped to think am i being nice enough to the new guy in the office the myth of sisterhood is a chink in feminism's armor it means that any sort of woman on woman aggro can be perceived as proof that feminism is a lie or a joke or a facade when woman on woman aggro is often entirely legitimate an inevitable consequence of our burgeoning ambition or our increasing desire to assert ourselves on twitter it's important to check the origins of your rage against any other chick. Is it rational? Do you know her in some meaningful way? Did the consequences of her actions do some quantifiable damage? That sort of thing. Always reserve hating another woman's guts for when she does something bad in a real and measurable way. You don't want to be wasting that sort of emotional energy on the bikini-friendly contestant of this season's I'm a Celebrity. And she ends with a little note on kindness. Proceed with it, but never confuse it with meekness, subservience, self-defeating acts of people-pleasing, or softness. Actually, scratch that last one. A little softness is just fine. And uh, yeah, that is pretty much Polly Vernon's Hot Feminist. Um, a very short summary of it. There's a hell of a lot more in here, a hell of a lot more points I could have talked about and what I would have liked to talk about, but this is already a long video. There's not really enough time. I just thought this would raise a few really interesting and important talking, point, talking points about feminism in general and how we approach it and just how we are to each other and how we treat each other. I think we need to stop gatekeeping and stop being like, if you're not with me 100%, you must be against me. That's not the case. We need to stop being so outraged at people. We need to stop wanting to cancel everyone who does any tiny little thing that we don't deem 100% perfect. The truth is that everyone online, everyone we see on TV, everyone whose books we read, whose writing we read, whose blogs we read, they're all real people. Every YouTuber, every person on Twitter, every person who hides behind an avatar or who shows their face, they're still real people with real thoughts and feelings and emotions and everyone screws up sometimes. And we can't help that, it's a part of who we are. We need to learn to critique actions and not people. We need to learn to educate rather than to just try and cancel them, try and shut them down completely. No one is ever going to agree with everyone 100%, but we can try and make sure as many of us are on the same page about the big issues as possible and work together on that and try and bring everyone together in those ways. There are so many other YouTubers I love that I don't agree with 100% on about everything. You guys know I've spoken about Ocean before who is absolutely fantastic. He is a polytheist. I'm an atheist. We should clash. That's a huge thing to disagree on. But I absolutely love him to bits and he's one of my favourite people in the world because we have so much more in common then we have different. And I think that's something we need to focus on. The shared goals, the shared uh, aims, the, the, the similarities, not the slight differences between us that ultimately are going to be inconsequential. Another example, look at someone like Shannon who, she's a mother and I never want kids. That's a huge thing that we could definitely disagree on. But again, I think Shannon is one of the most wonderful, kind-hearted, intelligent, just amazing people I've ever had the pleasure to meet and I think she's fantastic and when we talk we bond over our shared love of wine and um, neuroscience and psychology and that kind of thing. We have more in common than we have different even though some of the differences between us are huge and again this is what I mean find those shared similarities and find those shared goals and focus on them and work on creating a community of amazing people that are different and don't just 
have every single view in common. It's okay to have people around you who believe different things to you, because that's how we grow as people. We challenge each other and we learn from them. And um, yeah, I know this has been a long video, but that's, I think, what I want you to take away from this. And that's what I'm going to be taking away from this. And also, let's all be hot feminists and go out, read this book, even if you end up hating it. I recommend you read it because I do think it's going to challenge you and make you think about things you haven't thought about before and I thoroughly recommend it, I think it's fantastic and Polly is a fantastic person. When I started reading her book she actually reached out to me on uh, Instagram and we had like a little chat and it, it was wonderful, she's a lovely person and I thoroughly enjoy her writing style, her personality and uh, screw those negative reviews. In the theme of this video um, I also want to kind of like direct you to my merch store in a little bit of shameless self-promotion and like I say following the themes of this video I have this gorgeous t-shirt that is one of my favorite ones I've ever worked on that is all about like being kind and just enjoying yourself and I think it's a really empowering message and it's one of my favorites so if you'd like to get one of those t-shirts you can do they're available in, in my merch store now you can also get them as hoodies and jumpers and that kind of thing I think this one might be available on tank tops as well I'm not sure um, but if you want to check out that or any of my other merch designs you can do now I will pop a link in the description below but yeah that's about me done for today shameless self-promotion over thank you for watching I appreciate you guys so much you're always amazing and I love your support so thank you for watching today and I will see you again soon